One day in 1905, a 19-year-old Moscow newspaper reporter called Solomon Shershevsky turned up for work as usual and waited for the daily meeting with the editor of the paper during which assignments for the day would be given out. Unlike any of his colleagues, but as with his usual practice, Solomon did not take any notes about the meeting. The editor had noticed this before with surprise and this time decided to reproach Solomon. After all, often there were numerous names and addresses given out and Solomon ought to record the details. The editor decided to test Solomon by asking for details of what he had said. Solomon proceeded to repeat all that he had been told word for word. This incident changed Solomon's life forever and was the starting point of his new career as the world's greatest mnemonist or memory man. The editor was amazed by Solomon's memory, whereas Solomon was amazed that anyone should think his memory was remarkable. Sensing an interesting story, the editor sent Solomon to the local university for some further tests of, of his memory ability, and this is where he met Alexander Romanovich Luria, a Russian professor who was to spend the next 30 years systematically studying the most remarkable memory ever examined. Luria started the examination by collecting biographical details. Solomon, a Latvian by birth, was in his late twenties, and his father owned a bookstore, and therefore, not surprisingly, his mother was well read. His father could apparently recall the location of every book in the store, and his mother, a devout Jew, could quote long paragraphs from the Torah. His brothers and sisters were well-balanced individuals, and there was evidence of some musical talent within the family. Indeed, Solomon trained as a violinist until a near infection put an end to that choice of profession, and he turned to journalism instead. Given the suggested link between exceptional ability and mental illness, Luria noted no history of mental illness in the family. Luria began by giving Solomon a series of tests to ascertain his memory capacity. Words and numbers were presented to him in spoken or written form, and he had to replicate them in the original form. Luria started with 10 or 20 items, but increased this gradually to 70 items. Solomon recalled all the items perfectly. Solomon could also report the letters or numbers in reverse order, or determine which letter or number followed another in a sequence. This is known as a serial probe technique, whereby a list of letters or numbers is read out and then one item is repeated and then the item that follows has to be recalled. This can be conducted as a test of short-term memory. Most people find this task extremely difficult, especially with a long sequence of items, but Solomon had no difficulty with it. However, with Solomon it was discovered that he was using a different system of remembering the items not one based on normal acoustic or sound processing, but one that involved images or pictures. This also meant that once learned, Solomon would remember the sequence of items indefinitely, whereas most normal participants would have little recall for the items beyond the minutes that the experiment would take. Luria began to present Solomon with different memory tasks. Most people find meaningful words far easier to recall than nonsense syllables or trigrams, three consonants with no meaning, but Solomon had no problem with any of them. The same findings occur with sounds and numbers. All Solomon required was a three or four second delay between each item to be recalled. In order to test the capacity of memory, researchers have devised a technique developed originally by Jacobs in 1887 called the serial digit span technique. This involves gradually increasing the items to be remembered until the participant becomes confused and can no longer recall the items in the correct order. If you try this, you'll find that the typical digit span is 7 plus or minus 2 items. However, with Solomon, it was Luria who became confused, since Solomon appeared to have no limit to his digit span. Luria arranged for Solomon to return to the university for further tests of his memory. At this session, Solomon could recall perfectly all of the previous items he had learned. This results confused Luria even more, since Solomon seemed to have no limit either to the capacity of his memory or the durability of the traces he retained. Luria couldn't measure either the capacity or duration of Solomon's memory, both of which can usually be tested fairly easily in a laboratory. Even more amazingly, Luria found out 16 years later that Solomon could recall the items learned at his original sessions. Yes, yes. This was a series you once gave me when we were in your apartment. You were sitting at the table, and I in the rocking chair. You were wearing a grey suit, and you looked at me like this. For the next 30 years, Luria decided to concentrate on describing Solomon's memory, or to provide a qualitative account of its structure. 
Solomon used one particular mechanism to aid his memory. Regardless of the type of information or its form, Solomon always converted these items into visual images. Providing Solomon was given the time to convert the items into images, there was no limit to the capacity or duration of his memory. A table of 50 random numbers would typically take him about 3 minutes to commit to memory. Solomon had an amazing memory. He even had memories dating back to his childhood that few of us possess. It is suggested that our memories of our first few years aren't re because we haven't learned to encode the material due to a lack of development in terms of memory and or speech. However, Solomon encoded his memories in a different way, and since this ability was innate, he possessed it at a very early age. Solomon reported memories from lying in his cot as an infant when his mother picked him up. I was very young then, not even a year old perhaps. What comes to mind most clearly is the furniture in the room. I remember that the wallpaper in the room was brown and the bed was white. I can see my mother taking me in her arms. He even recalls his smallpox vaccination. I remember a mass of fog, then of colours. I know this means that there was noise, most likely a conversation, but I don't feel any pain. Of course it's impossible to discover the accuracy of these memories, but their vividness certainly suggests an element of truth. Luria reports that Solomon often had difficulty with encoding or processing information if there was a distraction during the encoding process. This included the experimenter merely saying yes or no to indicate whether Solomon had heard an item correctly. Solomon reported that these words blurred the image in his head and created puffs of steam or splashes, which made it more difficult for him to see the items. Later, during his stage shows, coughs in the audience would have a similar distracting effect. It seemed that all information created an image in Solomon's head, regardless of whether or not he wanted it to. Psychologists have consistently shown that the use of imagery is a particularly effective technique for improving long-term memory. Solomon seemed to have a particular visual ability related to synesthesia. Synesthesia is a form of combined perception where two or more senses become intertwined. This means that when one of the senses is stimulated, it automatically triggers another sense that acts involuntarily. For example, days of the week may be associated with particular colors. There is no explanation for why the senses intertwine. These experiences are always the same. The same stimuli consistently evoke the same reactions. This is because they are not learned, they just occur naturally. Synesthesia tends to be one-directional, meaning one sense may spark off another sense, but it doesn't tend to work the other way around. Since synesthesia is the crossing of two or more senses, there are 31 different possible combinations of sight, smell, touch, taste and hearing. Most people experience the fusion of only two senses, but Solomon appeared to have four senses joined. Only his sense of smell did not intertwine with his other senses. The ability Solomon possessed to form visual images for words was the key to his remarkable memory recall. Whenever he heard a word, whether it made sense or not, an immediate visual image was created. He reported that even if he heard the word green, he would see a green flower pot. With the word red, he would see a man in a red shirt waving towards him. Blue conjured up an image of someone waving a blue flag from a window. Even nonsense words conjured up immediate visual impressions that he could continue to see clearly years later. When Solomon was asked to listen to tones of, or voices, he saw images. An example of this is the report he gave when asked to listen to a tone of 30 cycles per second at 100 decibels. I saw a strip 12 to 15 centimeters in width, the color of tarnished silver. Gradually the strip narrowed and seemed to recede. Then it was converted into an object that glistened like steel. Such examples clearly show how synesthesia worked. Repetitions of tones months later led to exactly the same images being recalled. Every sound he heard summoned up a memorable visual image with its own distinct form, color, and taste. Solomon's recall of numbers worked in a similar way. He reported the shape of the number one as being pointed, firm, and complete, the number two as being flatter, rectangular, whitish in color, and sometimes almost gray. Numbers also produce more concrete images. The number one was a proud, well-built man, number two was a high-spirited woman, and so on. For Solomon, vision, taste, touch, and hearing all merged together. Later on in his career as a professional mnemonist, 
Audience tasted him with nonsense words or foreign languages, and even these unfamiliar words produced sensations of taste, touch, or vision. The method of loci is a mnemonic or memory enhancement technique that Solomon used in order to remember items in a particular sequence. The method of loci refers to objects to be remembered that are imagined in known locations and dates back to ancient Greece where orators would use it to remember long speeches. In order to use the method of loci, you need to imagine a familiar route or location. Solomon often used the street or road in his hometown in Latvia or a well-known route in Moscow. Once imagined, the images to be remembered need to be placed at points on the walk. Items are distributed at various locations such as in houses, by gates, trees or shop windows. In order to recall the list, you need to retrace your steps and see the items placed there. Solomon's amazing visual memory meant that he had no difficulty retracing these walks. For him, it was as though he was actually walking along the route. On the few occasions when he failed to recall an item, he explained that he had placed the item in a location which made it difficult to see on retracing the route. Sometimes he placed the item in a dimly lit spot, say in the shadows of a tree, and therefore he would not notice the item in question. For Solomon, these mistakes were defects of perception, or not seeing the items on the route, rather than defects of memory. One example of this involved the word egg which he placed against the white wall and then failed to spot on retracing his steps. When Solomon later became a mnemonist, he became more careful at placing objects in appropriate places and mistakes such as these became rarer. When it became clear to Solomon that people might be interested in his memory ability, he quit his newspaper job and became a professional mnemonist performing his memory feats on stage. Audiences often try to catch him out by giving him nonsense or made-up words to recall. He recalls one of his most difficult performances when he was asked to recall a long series of repetitive syllables, over 50, such as M-A, V-A, N-A, S-A, N-A, S-A, V-A, M-A, and so on. Solomon stated, No sooner had I heard the first word than I found myself on a road in the forest near the little village of Malta, where my family had a summer cottage when I was a child. The third word, damn it the same consonants again. I knew I was in trouble. I was going to have to change paths in the woods for each word, but it would take more time, and when you're on the stage, each second counts. I could see someone smiling in the audience, and this too immediately was converted into an image of a sharp spire, so that I felt as if I had been stabbed in the heart. Despite his reservations, Solomon still managed to reproduce the sequence correctly. Eight years later and without prior warning, Luria asked Solomon to repeat this monotonous list of syllables and he had no difficulty whatsoever. As a mnemonist, Solomon tried to simplify this recall technique in order to speed up his memory performance. As mentioned, he ensured that the mental images were clearly seen and he also developed a shorthand system of his images. He tried to create images that were less detailed. Solomon found that he could still recall the words and that the less detailed images took less time to encode. Using such techniques, he could recall words in a foreign language, meaningless mathematical formula, and nonsense syllables. Luria was adamant that Solomon's memory was an innate characteristic, that he had been born with it. The use of mnemonic techniques during his stage performances were simply devices to enhance and speed up his natural ability to satisfy a demanding audience. Solomon's incredible visual memory ensured that he could perform bodily feats due to the power of thought. This was no idle boast and he could regulate his heartbeat and even his perception of pain through imagery. To alter his heartbeat, he merely had to imagine that he was running for a train or imagine he was lying perfectly still and relaxing in bed. These images were so real for him that his body altered its physiological responses. In addition, he was able to alter the temperature of his hands by imagining placing one of them in a hot stove while holding ice in the other hand. Recordings of the temperature of the skin on each hand show that they had changed by a couple of degrees. It is clear by now that Solomon possessed a unique memory. However, there were downsides to his abilities. Due to the abundance of images that were associated with each word he heard, he had to have information read to him fairly slowly in order for him to process the words as an image. Apparently, on meeting Solomon for the first time, many people reported him as appearing rather disorganized, dull, or slow-witted. This was certainly true if he was read a story at a fast pace. 
Solomon found that the array of images of each word created meant that they collided with the images of the reading voice and those of any extraneous sounds. The result would be a complete chaos of images. A simple passage of writing sometimes became a Herculean effort of processing. Skim reading a passage or taking just the gist of a passage seemed beyond him since every word summoned up a rich array of images. Solomon found it impossible to single out most important or key points from text. Each detail in any text produced further images that often took him further and further away from the central point of any passage. He was very poor at processing abstract ideas as well. To Solomon, everything was processed visually. He often found that one word in a passage sparked off an image, and then from that image he would move to a related one not associated with the original text. His own thinking would guide his linked images rather than the text itself. Abstract words were a real problem as well, since they could not easily be visualized. For example, he said that it was impossible to see the word infinity. He saw the word something as a dense cloud of steam, and the word nothing as a thinner, completely transparent cloud. In effect, he could not grasp an idea or word unless he could see it, and some ideas or words cannot be easily visualized. Solomon was very poor at coping with synonyms or metaphors due to the images that crowded in on him. To him, a child, youngster, infant, or toddler meant many different things, whereas the writer might use them interchangeably without a great deal of thought. Furthermore, words with many alternative meanings, such as wear is in to wear away or to wear a coat, would cause serious problems since the image would always be the same despite the different meanings. Often, Solomon would get so bogged down in the detail that he couldn't see the overall picture. Poetry was almost impossible for him to read. Every word would form an image, whether or not it was the one that the poet intended, and the image Solomon saw would more often than not disguise the associated meaning. Unlike most people who spend time trying to devise strategies for remembering, Solomon spent time trying to devise strategies to forget. It became increasingly clear to him that he needed to forget information. After becoming a professional mnemonist, when he would give several performances a day in the same venue, Solomon found that he was having difficulty organizing all the material he had to remember. Solomon developed a number of strategies to try to overcome this. He deliberately tried to restrict the images that he used to aid recall. He tried to focus his attention and limit the images to the essential details that he would need to recall the item to be remembered. He still remembered the material perfectly, but did not need to encode all the rich details that each item would normally evoke. Although this helped, he still needed a way to completely forget material rather than just code things in a simpler form. One way he tried to forget was to mentally rearrange material on paper that he had remembered on previous performances. He then imagined screwing up the paper and throwing it away. However, he still reported difficulties of forgetting. Solomon found interference security of material in a subsequent performance was similar to that presented during an earlier performance. This is an example of proactive interference where old memories affect newer memories. Furthermore, the more similarities between the material, the greater the interference. Although it must still be recorded, Solomon did not actually forget any of the material, he merely found it more confusing to learn and recall. So Solomon still needed to develop a technique for forgetting. He realized that many people wrote things down in order to try aid recall, which to him seemed ridiculous. Nevertheless, he wondered if he might write things down in order to forget. He reasoned that if something was written down, there would be no reason to continue to remember it. He tried this technique and then discarded the pieces of paper, even burning them on occasion. Unfortunately, he could still see the numbers on the charred embers. It seemed to Solomon that he would be forever affected by the inability to forget and this became an increasing worry to him. Solomon's life was a paradox. His greatest ability was also his greatest handicap. His amazing memory meant that he found it difficult to forget, but despite this, he did appear slow and forgetful to others. His memory created practical difficulties for him on a day-to-day -day basis, and he continued to have difficulty distinguishing reality from the images created in his head. He spent hours each day daydreaming on a journey through his remarkable memory. Although successful as a stage mnemonist for a time, he had many other jobs and never really found a satisfying career that exploited his astounding abilities. It is particularly difficult to draw parallels from his memory to everyday memory ability since his capacity and processing techniques differed so markedly from the norm. Solomon ended up working as a taxi driver in Moscow and never had any excuse for going the wrong way. There are mixed reports about what happened to Solomon and to some extent he disappeared off the radar. The New York Times reported that he married and had one child 
and that he died in 1967, aged 72. Professor Luria continued with his successful academic career until his death in 1977. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a like and subscribe for more videos like this one.